Um, well, I now um, run a macroeconomic consulting um, uh, advisory company based in, uh, based in New York. But in my former life, we all have former lives, uh, part of my former life was spent in, uh, I have to confess it, in the European Commission where I was in charge of the monetary and exchange rate um, uh, policy area uh, at a time when EMU was being put together. In a subsequent former life, um, I worked um, ultimately for the infamous Bon KIG London branch, or the Curzon Street Casino, as it's sometimes incorrectly, in my view, known. Um, and those two sets of experiences, I think, have shaped what I want to say this morning. There's the, the political side, uh, the economic theory, the bad economic theory side coming from the, uh, my commission days, uh, from my time in Bonk AIG, which was right at the heart, if, if you like, of supporting what was a credit bubble in Europe. And that's the key point I want to, to make. EMU, European Monetary Union, has been and is a credit bubble. And if you think about what the defining characteristic from a risk point of view uh, what the defining characteristic of monetary union is, is that it, it transformed currency risk into credit risk. Now, unfortunately, and with the connivance, if you like, of the authorities, the credit risk part of that was not realised. In fact, Jean-Claude Trichet, the um, president of the European Central Bank, as long ago as 1994, said that monetary union will allow the elimination of risk premiums in Europe. And he's more recently said a number of times that the euro has provided ex-ante assistance to the peripheral countries by allowing easy external financing conditions. In other words, there's a credit bubble. We should all rejoice, rejoice. There's been a credit bubble. That's what monetary union is about. The problem is that credit bubbles involve enormous credit losses when the bubble bursts. Uh, now, to some extent in the US, to a considerable extent perhaps, the credit losses from the subprime bubble have been realised and have been taken and been distributed. In Europe, they haven't. That is still to come. One way or another, someone, and that someone is likely to have a <laughs> 80 million of them likely to have German accents, right. <laughs> are going to have to, to pay. They're going to take those credit losses. Now, but I said that monetary union transforms currency risk into credit risk. And I think that points to uh, an important, um, um, uh, something very important to say, that when one's thinking about risk and one's thinking about debt, the key thing is not so much the public sector, it is the nation as a whole. It's the aggregation of the public sector, the corporate sector, the, the household sector, and that's reflected in current account imbalances. And if we could have um, slide 41... You can see just how large current account imbalances in the euro area have, have been. Uh, th these are taken from 2007 values, which is a reasonable guess of a period at which everyone was at full employment. So these are full employment uh, concepts. They're, they're enormous. Now, can they be adjusted? Well, if one thinks about the, 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 the current account identity, essentially says with one or two bells and whistles that the current account is equal to the trade account, including services, goods and services, the income account and the transfers account. If you have got an unsustainable current account deficit, as the uh, peripheral countries of the euro area clearly have, two things can happen. Either you don't adjust those deficits, in which case the external debt ratio goes asymptotically towards infinity, which means that the, the expected value of claims on these countries goes to zero as, uh, uh, as time goes on. And that's one way in which the credit losses can be realised. You, know, you just let these things run, this Ponzi game, run on forever and you know you're never going to get your money back. If there is going to be adjustment, it has to come through the trade account, the income account, or the transfers account, or some combination of all of them. Well, adjustment through the trade account within a fixed current, fixed exchange rate areas, as Adam has been suggesting, is virtually impossible when you've got a massive starting deficit. To improve competitiveness, 
within such an area means you've got to have what, again, my uh, friend, in inverted commas, Jean-Claude Trichet, referred to as competitive disinflation. You've got to force nominal wages down, and the only way you can force nominal wages down, um, other than, you know, Mussolini tried it through diktat in 1928 and again, I think, in 1934, and it didn't work. The only way you can force nominal wages down is through recession, unemployment, combination of recession, unemployment, falling nominal wages, deflation, inevitably means that people go bankrupt. So that's the second route to widespread default. Um, can you get out of that through euro depreciation? Well, in principle you can, but as chart um, 40 suggests, for Greece, for instance, or Spain, to get out of, to, to do their trade adjustment through euro depreciation will require ludicrously weak levels of the euro, which is simply totally unacceptable to, to Germany. Um, so trade adjustment, I think, is impossible, and that chimes with what Adam was saying about the difficulties of budgetary adjustment. If you try to do a budgetary adjustment without um, the ability to have lower interest rates or a weaker currency, it doesn't work. We've seen that in Ireland. We are seeing it in Greece. We're going to see it in Portugal and Spain. Third possibility, uh, so the, the, the next possibility is adjustment of the current account through the income account. Well, basically, you say, sorry, this debt, you know, we're not honouring it, so we're not going to pay you the interest on this debt. And clearly, that is a live possibility <coughs> for some of these, uh, some of these countries. Um, as painful for the people who hold the debt, not least the banks, I'm sure this is something we'll discuss later, okay. not least for the European Central Bank, perhaps above all, uh, but it's also not enough. The starting positions of the countries we're talking about, for the, which for the moment are Ireland, Portugal, Greece and Spain, are just so bad on the trade side that even if you've completely eliminated their net interest payments to the rest of the world, they would still need a substantial trade adjustment. Default would help in that sense, in lots of other senses in which it wouldn't help. It would help in that sense, but it wouldn't be enough. Well, what about transfers? If we're thinking about um, current account adjustment rather than budgetary adjustment, and we're acknowledging that if you don't have a trade adjustment, if you don't have default and adjustment through the income account, helping out these countries through the transfer account would have to be a perpetual process. Not just a one-off loan, but gifts, unrequited transfers year after year after year forever. And if you include, as one should, because of the workings of moral hazard, once you start giving money to one country, every country is going to want it. If you include France and Italy, in the group of countries that would need to be recipients of transfers from Germany, then the cost to, let's call it the German bloc, roughly speaking, Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, Finland, would be something like 7% of their GDP every year forever. Now, pretty quickly, Austria, the Netherlands, and Finland would drop out, and you'd be left with just Germany. And you'd have Germany having to pay something like 8 or even more percent of its GDP every year forever. And at any sort of feasible discount rate, the present value of that stream is as big as the intended stream of Versailles war reparations. The actual stream of reparations, of course, was much lower because Germany couldn't and wouldn't pay. But the, the transfer solution in Europe would be as big for Germany as the intended burden of Versailles. And that, too, I think, is clearly not politically possible. Now, I'm not... I've probably run on too long. I'm yeah. not going to talk about one other possibility which maybe Valeria may talk about, and that's adjustment through productivity improvements. I'd just like to say in advance that I think <laughs> it is not feasible, but other people <laughs> have more to say about that. I, I think we'll come so. back to that. Uh, thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, Bernard and Adam are both British, although Bernard now lives in New York. We'll hear a different voice from Italy, Valerio. You want to introduce yourself and give yes. us your brief presentation? Yes, Mike. Well, thanks for having already destroyed my point uh, <laughs> before starting. Uh, but uh, I will try to uh, say a few words of uh, a bit more optimism. 
And first of all, Bernard, you shouldn't be ashamed of having taken part to the European construction, but on the contrary, you should be proud of it. And uh, uh, that what happened, what happened across Europe in the last uh, few years is uh, something of great historical value. We created a, a unique currency where everybody else in the world was skeptical and against it until the night before the actual uh, development of it. Uh, we have now 17 uh, member states, as you already uh, reminded us, that are using it extensively. Um, and uh, having accepted the European project meant for all the countries accepting the Euro adoption, uh, with the exception of England, which expressly uh, asked for that uh, uh, permission not to be forced to adopt the euro. And that's the only single case. And, and Denmark. And Denmark, and Denmark. Sorry. Yes, of course. Just and like Denmark. in Charlemagne's day. Then all, all the other <laughs> countries, by signing the treaty, by accepting <coughs> the European dream and the European vision, by definition and by contract, they have accepted that they will be adopting the euro sooner or later. Uh, the the, the, the uh, the date, the deadline was not fixed and is not fixed in a, in a rigid way, but what it is fixed is that they are all going, except England and, and Denmark, to uh, the Euro adoption. The difficulty is that governments either don't understand or are misleading their populations about what has got to happen. Greece will come back for more money after the summer. The existing Greek plan calls for them to go into the market mm -hmm. next year. That's clearly impossible. They cannot possibly issue new debt at, uh, at current market rates. They've got to come back to, uh, to Europe and ask for more money. That's, I think, you know, but Germany is more the key oh, sure. than, than Finland. Germany is, is the country that has the, uh, the deep pockets. But yes. The problem for Germany, as I said before, is that once you create a credit bubble in which Germany was the main participant in terms of providing, you know, providing the credit, Germany is going to have to take massive losses. EMU is a credit bubble. Either it doesn't burst, and debt is worthless, or it does burst, and everyone defaults. Now, what does it mean to say that Germany is a, a, a strong and... Um, um, uh, reliable phrase, partner. Uh, uh, reliable what partner. What does it mean? Well, what Germany is doing is insisting on a strategy of austerity plus lending. And as Adam suggested right at the beginning, that's just hopeless. The austerity programs plus lending in these countries are simply going to produce prolonged recession, deflation, and that combination leads to default. And in fact, the, the cost to Germany, that ultimate default through uh, recession and deflation, and the cost of German banks will be much greater than the cost of German banks of restructuring and default now. That cost in itself would be significant, but the cost of allowing the default to come a few years down the line through the recession and deflation route would be much higher. Because the problem is, you know, is politics, as many of the sessions in this uh, conference have talked about political incentives, and the, the incentives for existing bank CEOs, let's say, in, in, in Germany, or existing CEOs of exporting companies in Germany, or the German government, is to say, kick the can down the road, I'm not going to be the CEO in five years' time, I don't care what happens then. It may be worse in five years' time if we carry on down this path, but I don't care. And the problem with Germany is that Germany has been ruled since the war by a coalition. I'm not talking about CDU, FDP or SDP, uh, SPD, I'm talking about a coalition of bankers, exporters and Europhile diplomats, which has ruled that country ever since the war, at the expense of consumers, taxpayers, voters in, in Germany. Now, I think Christina that, may have a different view yes, on that. I, but why don't, why don't you finish, Bernard, and then we'll go to... Well, I think, you know, if that... Yes, what is going to happen if Germany has to accept that it has to, not just to lend on a one-off basis to these peripheral countries, but to give them 7 or 8% of its GDP every year forever, and that's the only way of avoiding the austerity, recession, depression route. It's not going to be politically possible. If it, it won't be politically possible in a democracy. I think that's the key 
way of putting it. And, you know, quite frankly, Valerio, to talk of the European Union as a democratic achievement is nonsense. The European Union is explicitly <laughs> anti-democratic. It I is explicitly... Valerio will have some reactions It is explicitly law-destroying. It's for the benefit of a nomenclatura at the expense of democracy. It's an area with no demos. It's an area whose telos, forgive me for using these terms, is... Uh, its ethos is bureaucratic and corporatist, and its telos is, yeah. is essentially to destroy what has been seen for the past 60 years as the triumph, seen rightly or wrongly, probably wrongly, as the triumph of a so-called Anglo-Saxon model in the world. Well, but, but that but really shakes point. things up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> that shakes things up a lot, as a matter of fact. Probably you want to suggest uh, a monarchy Bettina, also across, uh, across Europe. Uh, no, uh, I'd, like, I'd like to see freedom. Let's, give, let's, give, let's give, let Bettina react to, yeah, to no. one of the things. And then we'll turn to Valerio and, and Adam as well. I would not be that negative, Bernard, I, as I have to say. I, well, I I've been see very restrained, Bettina. But so I, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> but I see if, if we balance these, uh, these things here. Bettina, I, I do you want to comment on uh, Bernard's point about who runs Germany, uh, yeah, the coalition I, and so I, forth? I have not come across bankers who are, who are sitting in the parliament at this stage. Well, that's the point. There's <laughs> extra parliamentary. And all also behind the scenes. I, I think that's, that's something which um, we, we, we should discuss uh, more <laughs> well, in depth yeah. here. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Valerio, you have some well, reactions. Well, I can understand that uh, from an, uh, a British perspective, uh, <laughs> you would prefer a monarchy across Europe, <laughs> but uh, I... <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I exa uh, that's I, exactly I, what the Europeans want. They want a monarchy, you know, or an oligarchy, uh, 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 not a democracy and not a free society. It's a f I, uh, I agree with what Bettina was saying about looking at f things in perspective. Uh, what we are talking about. Uh, can you just show again this uh, slide here, the one that we have on the monitor about the GDP, yeah. the number 20? Uh, again, uh, we have to look at the uh, countries in an aggregated way when we look at the debts. It is true, Greece has a huge uh, <coughs> public debt, government debt, but overall is in the same situation as Germany and a little bit worse than uh, US or Italy, as you can see from, from this uh, uh, slide. Well, forgive me, uh, Valerio, we... this is simply misleading. Those are gross debt figures. And if you look at Ireland, the United Kingdom, of course they have problems. Their banking sectors were overinflated, and we've seen significant problems as a result of that. Yes. So those are gross debt figures. Yeah. If, the, the, if you take in the asset side and look at the net external debt, the country's concerned, then there are three that stand out as being massively out of line. And those are Greece, Spain, Portugal, all of which have external debt ratios of more than 100% of GDP. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Germany so has got massive uh, net external claims on the rest of the world. Britain is more or less balanced. Um, the three that stand out are Greece, Italy, Spain. Of course, one can't ignore the financial risks involved in having a massive financial sector, as was the case in Britain and, uh, and even more particularly in, in Ireland. But if one, if one wants to do the analysis of these things, how does the banking sector affect the external adjustment? One has to look at the perpetuity cost of bank losses, which is something my yes, firm... Yes, that, that is exactly no, the point. Why uh, don't sorry, you come back uh, and... That was just my pre the premise of my point, uh, because you, if you look at it in, in absolute value and in a broader perspective, we come up with a situation where uh, from September 15, 2008, we have injected trillion of dollars in the banking system to bail them out, trillion of dollars. Here we're talking about a few dozens of billions. So nothing in comparison with what was did to bail out the banking system, the perpetuity which, was, cost is what which, was, which was at the heart of the current uh, dramatic situation. The heart so of the situation is a credit bubble created by monetary union. Yes. It manifested itself not in the banking sector. Uh, not in Greece, the Euro. public sector. Yeah. This is but, a very exciting uh, debate. I, no, just, I just wanted to complete this, this, I want to this to part yeah. and then uh, I leave the floor to you. Uh, so we're talking about... Uh, 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 peanuts compared with the trillions and trillions of dollars uh, uh, in the sector. And then you're talking about the uh, cost of non-restructuring, but we should discuss about the cost of restructuring. Of course. Because if you do restructure, it will, be a dramatic Im it will have a dramatic impact into the euro stability yes. and into the rest of Europe's stability. That is why the political leadership across Europe 
including the German political leadership, including Italian political leadership and, and, and France and others, they are definitely committed not to uh, restructure the, uh, those, those countries. And talking well, about, not, about would, Greece... I'm sorry, the German government has repeatedly hinted that it thinks a Greek restructuring is inevitable. Well, there are different uh, positions from different political leaders, and uh, every time they have local elections, they, of course, have to well, speak let's hear, to let's their electoral the, What our German colleague will say about that should that, be the case. Uh, 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 One shouldn't forget. Do you, do you want to comment on the social unrest problem? <laughs> well... It's, it's going to be difficult enough in Britain sure. because of the austerity, but at least the unemployment rate is not going to go through the roof. I'm not saying it's going to go down much. It may even creep up a bit, but it's not going to go through the roof. It is not going to reach the 21.3% which we currently have in Spain. It's not going to reach the 15% in Greece or the 14% in Ireland or what Portugal is now going to, is now going to suffer. Um, I think it is almost inevitable that there will be serious social unrest if the current policy of lending, which is a short-term bailout of the creditors, it doesn't help the, uh, the supposedly the recipient country at all, of, so of so-called lending plus austerity is bound to lead to significant social unrest. And one shouldn't forget that of the, the four countries we've been talking about, within living memory, all of them have had civil wars, fascist dictatorships, revolutions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Well, that's true. That's history. <laughs> and it's the future. Well, it could easily be the future if this loon malignant lunacy of monetary union is pursued and crushes these countries into the ground. Let me turn in a different direction, but we're going to open it up for questions uh, after a few minutes. But let me turn in a different direction. The European Central Bank plays a preeminent role in managing the euro, in managing the European economy. What is your assessment of how the European Central Bank has been doing? Are they doing the right job? Are you criticizing them? Well, given they've got an impossible job, so one has to make, <laughs> one has to make allowances for them. But I think what, what we've seen <laughs> is that about three years ago, Jean-Claude Trichet, who of course has always been a, a yes. great proponent of monetary union, yes. fairly clearly came to the conclusion that the ECB could not manage monetary union, that the divergences were, were just too, too great. And ever since then, he's been trying to hand the burden over to the politicians, so do the transfers, please. We can't cope without the transfers. Mm -hmm. Implicitly, he's saying what I've been saying, that the, the trade adjustment route is impossible, that divergences are too great. The only, thing you can hold, uh, the only way you can hold it together is essentially for Germany to give, not lend, but give massive amounts of money every year. For, I think he's got that analysis right. He doesn't mm. make it explicit, of course, but it's, it's, it's very clear in everything he's done since then. It's also pretty clear that Axel Weber looked at the job and said, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, if you gave it to me on a plate, I might have it, but it's certainly not worth the, the politicking and the campaigning I'd have to do to get but, it. But uh, hi, Bruce Rabin. Um, one serious question, one less serious question. Would it be such a terrible thing if the Eurozone broke up and we went back to separate countries and separate currencies? And if not, could we swap Greece for Turkey? <laughs> Who wants to take that one on? Bernard, you want to do that? Well, well I, clearly, once you've created a mess, there is no clean way of getting out of it. Yeah. Any, and this is, you know, there are investors in the audience, one point I, would, I think one should try to get across more than any other. There is going to be a mess. The only question is what is the precise form of the, of the mess? Now, if the euro area broke apart entirely, which I think is simply not going to happen. Um, that's one set of issues. The more likely scenario, I think, that is within the next couple of years, two, three, who knows, countries drop off. And when that happens, what is that going to do to the euro? What is that going to do to financial markets? So I think the immediate impact would be everyone would say, oh my God, you know, they've all... Uh, 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 all the German banks' assets in Greece are now worth 50% less than they were uh, yesterday because Greece has devalued its new currency. There's going to be a banking crisis. Oh, my God, it's going to be worse than Lehman's. We've had three members of the ECB Council say that very explicitly just over the, over the past week. 
And the immediate reaction in the markets would probably be to switch from a risk on mode to a risk off mode. Um, um, funds would flow back into the dollar. The dollar would appreciate, which would be a, a very bad thing from a US point of view, because the US has severe problems of its own. Let's not forget that. Um, but after that panic was over and the German and French banks had been recapitalized, recapitalized by their governments and there had probably been nationalizations of banks in those, in those countries, the, the residual euro would be a stronger currency than the current euro. Reminiscent it, of the hard it, EQ. Of the, it, would, it would be somewhat like the hard EQ and it, it would appreciate. But then you, the question would be, could France live? <clears throat> could Spain live? Could Italy live if Spain is still in at that point? Could they live with a significantly appreciated euro? And certainly as far as um, uh, Spain and France are concerned, the answers are very different and no. Uh, the French economy is structurally weak. The French government is paranoid about its competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis Germany, wants to make as much progress in economic governments as it can before the German government fully <laughs> realizes just how weak it is, you'd have a new set of problems. So I think the, the sequence of events would be that if someone leaves, there's a banking crisis. There's a banking crisis in the country concerned. There would almost certainly have to be the imposition of, uh, of draconian capital controls before and around the event. The banking crisis wouldn't simply be in the country involved. It because, would be everywhere. Because of the balance sheet cost dependencies. Yeah. And because of the, the, ba the balance sheet costs to France and Germany, the, I think the initial reaction of the foreign exchange market would be to say, this is dreadful. Uh, we've got to, uh, we, 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 we adopt a very risk-off mode. Everything flows back into the dollar, uh, which certainly doesn't help the United States. I see but Valerio, Bruce, uh, Valerio has a appreciate. different perspective. Valerio? Yeah, completely different. That could simply not happen because in the Maastricht Treaty, the signature, the statute, is foreseen a Europe with the euro. So uh, that is a statute, that is a constitution of Europe that is foreseeing that. So we will never have... No one uh, takes any notice we, of we it. The ECB takes no notice of this. Well, there's statute. a commitment we, not to have no a certain... We will have ne notice. never uh, a uh, euro and a B euro. We will never have uh, a non-euro in Europe. We'll be the failure of the European vision, the failure of the European dreams. And as a matter of fact, why should it happen? It's the strongest uh, uh, currency in the world at the moment. It's the more... Uh, uh, presented as, as we have shown in the previous graph, it is more, more represented in the depth weight uh, uh, across all of the world. So why should we dismantle what has been successful and it's working at this because very moment? Because it is killing let's, four countries and will create political chaos. No, no, that's chaos. not true. Because those countries that are suffering at the moment, they are suffering not because of the euro, but do, because of their myopia in having done the wrong thing in the wrong moments. So they are suffering for mismanagement of their political leaders in all those the, countries. The myopia. Ireland, because of the hyper-fiscal and hyper-financial uh, uh, tension they did into the country, uh, uh, there, it's a nonsense that the banking system in Ireland has 1,000% of the GDP. Uh, excuse me, I, I think we better move on to another question because I think... Yeah. No, <laughs> but just, just a final point okay. about you, Greece. You wonder why we can't let's, 17 to let's agree. Trust, <laughs> exactly. Let's trust these changes and uh, I agree uh, I, I, I confess I fully agree with the austerity needs. Those countries need to be better managed and uh, it's not a short-term lending when you oblige them to take those changes and those political decisions that they didn't have the courage to take. So take the example of Greece, for instance. The little money that was given to Greece uh, forced them at the end of last year a 15% cut of public and, pri and private yes. wages, 10% yes. cut uh, on the pension system, 4% increase of the uh, VAT uh, in the country. So very, very hard measure. Of course, it's the, the population suffered. Of course, there was turmoil and confusion in the squares. And well, I mean, there's no, I said no one can get out of the mess uh, cleanly. Um, it, it's a dreadful situation. It's a condemnation of the fact that monetary union was put together, created the myopia that, al that allowed investors to think they could reasonably um, buy Greek 30-year bonds at 30 basis points over, over bonds. That would not have happened. The Greek government would not have been able to run the policy it did 
if there had not been monetary union. Yes, David Bradley with Heisinger Capital Management. Uh, my question would be, are asset sales a possible component of a solution, and why wouldn't, um, say, Greece or Spain or Ireland or Portugal look at selling assets in order to raise capital? Which assets did you have in mind? Yeah. They own ports, they own you know, airports, okay. it's regularly considered in the United States, and why isn't that being suggested, it's or a, is it a possibility? Well, it's uh, a, you are perfectly valid. right. The, March the 4th, the Prime Minister of Greece has just signed an agreement to sell 50 billion euro uh, assets, and they already sell, sold the uh, port in Athens to a Chinese uh, corporation. Uh, so they, they have started in that direction. You are perfectly right. This will be increased across all of those countries if they have assets to sell. But it won't, again, one has to take a perpetuity view of this, uh, as I was suggesting before when we were talking about the banking sector. And if you sell assets, well, by de you are selling assets. Uh, assets have an income stream attached to them. If you sell it, you'll forego, you'll forego the income stream. It may help you in the short term. Whether it helps you in the long term depends on whether the people who buy those assets are good to manage them better than you have. And that's a reasonable presumption that the reasonable, not a certain presumption, but a reasonable presumption that the private sector would manage those assets better. So what the, the benefit is to uh, a country selling assets is the difference in the rate of return on those assets between what it gets when it's managing them through the state uh, and what the country gets or what someone gets from, um, when they're managed through uh, 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 the private sector. And that rate of return difference could be significant, there's no doubt about it. But it's not, it's not in the Greek case. Greeks doesn't, Greece doesn't get a benefit of 50 billion from selling its ports. It gets a rate of return differential on that, which is probably positive, but very, very much smaller. And to, you know, th in, this in a sense ties in with the question of is there a productivity scenario that can get people out of the, out of the mess? Well, you know, if there were a productivity miracle, um, it would help. I mean, suppose, for instance, that Greek productivity doubled overnight. What would happen? Um, most of that benefit would be taken in increased Greek absorption, Greek consumption, Greek investment. Without a change in relative prices, the impact of that uh, unthinkably large um, change in productivity, the, the impact of that on external adjustment would be significant, but by no means, but nothing like the size of the productivity improvement. To achieve external adjustment in the countries we've been talking about through productivity improvement would require really quite you know, outlandishly unfeasible rates of growth of productivity. And I think the same point applies to the question of, of asset sales. One's thinking about the perpetuity and how much does that give you in additional income each year, how much of that additional income is absorbed domestically and how much of it goes to external adjustment. And the numbers don't add up. We have about five minutes left, so uh, who's our next questioner? Uh, yes, please, in the back there. Introduce yourself. Do you have the microphone? Good. Um, I was astounded to hear Helmut Kohl at the time of the Euro crisis last year in May being wheeled out and saying that if the Euro goes, Europe would be at war. Therefore, you have to save the Euro, which is really, I think, goes to your point that when you look at the history of Europe over the last century, according to this book, which is called The, Blood, uh, the Dark Continent, it is a, it is a a place where a lot of very horrible wars were fought. And the idea that Helmut Kohl believes that the mechanism of the Euro is the only thing that keeps Europe from being at war with each other is pretty amazing given what they went what we've all gone through between two world wars. So I guess the question is, if that's really is that really what is at stake? And if so Will the euro be preserved at all costs because the cost of war is just too expensive and horrible to contemplate? Adam, do you want to respond to that? Yes. Um, I think the single trading bloc has been a great um, uh, calming and unifying factor within Europe, but the euro isn't a requirement of having the single market. 
Um, so not having the euro, perfectly, you know, the UK is not part of the euro, and yet we are. Uh, our major dependency is with the with the single with the single trading market. So the single trading block has been a great unifying factor. I, I wouldn't describe that to the euro, though. You know, the origin of the EU is interesting. You go back to Jean Monnet. Jean Monnet was a French economist. After World War II, he decided he would do whatever he could to prevent another world war, another war in Europe. He pulled out maps, he pulled out input-output tables, he decided that the way to prevent this is to form a union, a coal and steel community, using the French coal mines and the German steel makers and so forth. And he proposed this idea, and eventually Schumann, the French foreign minister, adopted the idea. It's known as the Schumann Plan, but it was actually developed by Monet. And that was the origins that led to the Treaty of Rome and the European Union and so forth. And it's played a, a, a pivotal role in, in, the, in the history of Europe, certainly. Did you, Eddie, do you want to kind of respond, respond to this question as well? Yeah, we're done. Well, I explicitly, and I think Cole's comment was a disgraceful insult to the peoples of the, of the countries of, of Europe and uh, displays an ignorance of history, despite the fact that his uh, university studies were in, uh, were in history. And what led to the uh, two world wars in Europe in the, in, in, in the 20th century were clashes of empires. Uh, not clashes, clashes of nation states, but clashes of empires and proto-empires. And what the European Union wants to do is to create a new empire. You know, Martin Feldstein, uh, as long ago as 1993, said that, look at the United States. Um, would there have been the Civil War um, if the North and the South had been separate countries? Well, probably not. You know, maybe there, there are advantages to the world over the past century and a half from having had uh, a strong United, United States, uh, which is a well-rooted, democratic and less free than it was, but still fairly free um, political, political union. Um, none of those are the case of Europe, which is being put together by and for the benefit of a, a, of a nomenclatura, uh, with very little um, underlying public support. Uh, the, I agree entirely with Adam that the, if you create economic, financial, social chaos through the euro, as is, as is happening, you're much likely to have, at best, a, a more fractious Europe. I'm certainly not suggesting that we're going to see countries at war with one another. That's not going to happen with the euro or without it. What we are quite likely to see, unfortunately, is, as you suggested, very severe social political unrest, uh, regime change through extra-parliamentary channels, if I can put it that way. Um, let's take one more question, please. Introduce yourself. Uh, Dominique Miel from Canyon Capital. To uh, the British gentleman, what exactly do you think is anti-democratic and uh, elite-driven in the EU system? Uh, because coming from my seat, I just watched the most spectacular, antiquated, anachronistic display of uh, wealth and power of the elite in your country. Uh, well, people in, liked uh, it. It's cool. People liked it. It's a tourist attraction. measures for the masses. It's a tourist attraction with no power. <laughs> That's it. I mean, it, that, it's exactly it. You know, people like it. It is a symbol of nationhood. It's a, 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 a symbol of history with no power. One wishes it had had more power. And if the, if the, the in one particular <laughs> respect, oh, no. if, if. More if the monarchy, Brits. if the sovereign... That's why they want to destroy Europe and the euro. <laughs> we leave that to you. If the sovereign had done what her coronation oath required her to do and maintained the happy laws and constitution of the United <laughs> Kingdom, if she'd had the power to veto the, the various European treaties, that would have been a very good thing and it would have been extremely popular and would have made her very popular. That's the difference. It's always good being back in the colonies. Do you not being, miss being part of the empire? <laughs> <laughs> the, good, the good old days. Well, I, I am, let, let me say, I am what is often called, disparagingly, a little Englander. That is to say, I don't want Britain to have, or England to have, imperial pretensions. You know, it may have been a good thing, or it may not have been. 
two centuries ago. No, it isn't. Even I don't want we... anyone to have imperial pretensions, <laughs> and the European Union oh, does. Valeria wants that. Particularly word. because with that debt in the financial system, you cannot have any imperial pretension at all. Well, no one, no one <laughs> has them. The, the people in Britain <laughs> have them. There's a, a, a friend of mine who was at my college, studying the same subject as me 40 years ago, um, called Robert Cooper, who was the foreign policy advisor to Tony Blair, and is now the Director General of Political Relations in the European Council, who has propagated the idea of so-called liberal imperialism. It's the Europeans, and he, he, he is a massively pro-Europe, it is the Europeans who are imperialists.